This is Intro to Tendency. My name is Caitlin Kalusia. I run the marketing and communications team here at Tendency. So there's a picture of me so you can kind of see what I look like since you can't you can't see me. Um, this is a we, we do webinars, um, training classes for Tendency about twice a month. We actually don't have any more on the calendar for December just with the holiday, but starting in probably a week or so, we'll have a whole nother crop of January, February, March type classes. So they're not really on the calendar right now, but they will be shortly. Um, today we're going to cover what is Tendency, content management basics. Like I mentioned, Tendency is very module focused, so if you can master one of the modules, you can master all of the modules. So we're going to start with kind of the basics and then we're go, going to go into events and jobs and directories and some of those other modules. One thing that we're not going to really cover today is memberships. That's a separate class, so if you have membership questions, like I said at the end, I can address any of those. Uh, memberships is, is a big part of Tendency. It has a ton of features and it would take us way longer to get through this class if we tried to tackle all of the membership stuff too. So we're going to tackle just sort of the content management modules. We'll get through pretty much everything else today. So what is Tendency? Tendency is the software that powers your website. It allows you to manage the content on your website, things like pages, events, news. It allows people to contact you. You have contact forms, donations, um, and then membership management, which I mentioned will is, is a, a separate class that will uh, we'll have one scheduled probably in January to go through memberships if you have any questions on that. If you want to follow along with what we go through today, you can obviously log into your own website or you can always log into our Tendency demo site and I'm going to switch over and navigate there. So it's demo.tendency.com and I'm actually going to log out so you can see what it looks like completely fresh. So if you type in demo.tendency.com, you'll see this website, and this is a full functioning Tendency website. Up here on the top right, there is a little orange get started link, and it has a username, which is admin, and a password, which is Tendency. If you click on that, you can log into this site, and you can play with all of the features of Tendency that you want. So as always, you can follow along on your site, or if you want a site, this is a good way to, if you want to experiment with a new feature, or you want to add some test content and see what it looks like, and you're not going to hurt anything by making updates to this site. This site actually gets wiped clean. The database gets wiped every couple of days, so you're not going to hurt anything going in and playing with Tendency on the demo site. So that's the demo site. Um, Another really great resource that we have is this Tendency New Users Guide. So if you're brand new to Tendency or if you have people on your staff who have come on fresh, you can, you can send them to this link right here and I'll send out this PDF. Also, you can get there by going to, I'm flipping back again. Also, if I say I'm flipping somewhere, you know, I'm, I'm, I've just pulled up Tendency.com and you don't see it. Sometimes GoToMeeting has kind of a lag. Just type a little note in the chat box and I'll, and I'll, wait for it to catch up before I move on. So you should see tendency.com right now. Um, if you go over to resources, there's tendency help, all kinds of resources down here, help files, events, training events, videos, all kinds of things. We're gonna go to help files. So under help files, there is a category called getting started. And again, if you're brand new or if you have somebody come new to your staff, then these are all the sort of basic getting started help files. And there one, there's one that's called Start Here, New User's Guide to Tendency. And that's sort of got the top 10 help files that getting around, content management, kind of the basics. So if, you, if you're going back through this and you're adding content to your site and you're thinking, oh, what did she say? I can't remember. This, this is a really great resource as well. So let's look at, I'm gonna, I'm gonna navigate back to my demo site. And we're just going to do a quick sort of overview of when you log into Tendency, the first thing you'll see is this Tendency dashboard. And this is the latest version of Tendency. This is Tendency 5. I think we had one registrant who's on Tendency 4, which is the previous version, which is it's still module based. It still has a lot of the similar, uh, the modules are the same, but the interface is going to look a little bit different. So when you log in, you'll see something that looks a little more like this with these dashboard icons. Um, in the newer version of Tendency, we have what we call the um, the dashboard uh, dashlets is what we call them. And so when you first log into Tendency, and I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna close these green things because these are specific to the demo site. Okay, so it'll look something like this. And you'll see these dashlets that have 
data about your upcoming expiring members. Um, if you're not using memberships, it'll look kind of blank like this, but you'll see top five events by traffic, um, events that are coming up and how many people have registered for them, how many form submissions you've gotten, um, top five pages, things like that in this in this dashboard. And the reason we do that is so that when you log in kind of at a glance, you can see what's going on on your website. And say, for instance, if you don't use memberships and you want to, you know, you don't want these membership dashlets at the top, you just click customize dashboard statistics. And then these are all the options you have and you can just turn them on and off by unchecking them. You can drag and drop them. You know, you can say, oh, we really care about events. I'm going to move events up to the top. So when I log in, I see events first or I see forms first. And then you hit save and it will save those changes. So now you can see like we've got the event things at the top because that seems to be where the most traffic is. So that's the dashboard. Also on the dashboard, you've got things like admin quick links over here. You've got attendance, the feed from the tendency blog. So whenever we put like the latest one is a new feature. Um, and then the one before that is updates that we made. we're always pushing out updates. Most of them are pretty small just because we're pushing them out so often, but we'll at least make a blog post that says, hey, we have these new features. Now you can do this. Now you can do that. Um, if we do ever do a big push and a big change, you'll usually see us talk about it on the blog and the newsletter and the support portal, and we'll work really hard to get to get the news out. But there are a lot, we're always making uh, you know, small to medium-sized updates all the time, so you'll kind of see those in the tendency blog. Um, and then the tendency help is newest help files. So things that, for instance, in this training, if I get a really good question that I think, oh, that's, you know, I should have a, a help file, a documentation around that, I'll add it, add a help file. And then you'll get kind of the notification here that the newest help files, you know, that something's been added. Um, also navigating tendency, when you're logged in, you'll see this blue admin bar appear. Content, if you hover over content, these are each of the modules. So if you want to want to see, you know, what pages are on my site, what photo albums, what stories, what events, you can click on the name of the module and it will show you. And then these little quick links here are, if you know, if you want to add a new job, you just hit the plus sign next to jobs. If you want to search, you hit the search thing, the search magnifying glass. If you want to edit the settings, you hit the settings. So uh, no matter what module you're editing, you can kind of, you can always get to it this way. The other way that you can get to a module is if, for instance, you want to edit the events calendar, you can go to the events calendar and you can make edits in the tabs here. So there are a couple of ways in tendency to get any get around, get anywhere. If you're in tendency four, you won't have this admin bar. You'll have um, you can get there from the dashboard, go to the module under the tabs, and um, but in tendency five, we've really added a couple of other ways that you can get to content, no matter where you are in the site. So let's start with kind of content management basics. And we're going to start with CMS pages. So pages are kind of the building blocks of your site. Most of your content is going to be in just regular website pages. And so the, for me, the easiest way to edit content that already exists on your site is you go to a page and scroll down to the bottom. And if you're logged in, you'll see these, these extra links down here and just click the edit link. And then I can edit it straight from here. You can also, if you, if you're, you know, trying to dig up or find a page that exists that's not easy to get to, you can go to content and pages, and then you can search about and scroll down and find the about page and click edit from there. So you can always get to a page, even if it's not linked, even if it's private, you can go to pages and search for it. But for me, most of the time I'm editing content that I can get to, it's just easier for me to go, go to the about page and click edit. So now that we're in the edit screen, and if you add a new page, you get it's the same exact um, options that you have. Uh, each page has a title. It has a URL path. And so that is just demo.tenancy.com slash whatever's in this URL path. And then we have what's called a WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is what you get. And the WYSIWYG is on most all modules have this. It just allows you to add formatting. It allows you to add links and images, and you don't ever have to touch the code. So for instance, if I wanted to make, you know, if I wanted to make this a link, I just highlight it, I click the link button, I can either type in my link or I can copy and paste it in the link URL. I can tell it if I want it to open in a new window or in the same window, I can hit insert and then it's added a link and I don't ever have to touch the code. If you would like to touch the code, you can. There's an HTML uh, button right here on the top right. And if I click that, you'll see I see the code, oops, sorry, the code version of this page. 
So here's my link in code. So if you would like to use HTML, you can. Most most of our clients prefer not to if they don't have to. Um, the WYSIWYG, each of the buttons, it's pretty standard, uh, similar to what you would see in like a word processing program, bold, italics, underline, um, bulleted list, or you can make it, highlight it and make it a numbered list. You can add tables, you can left, left center right align content you can add links um, one thing with the links you'll see that they're not clickable right now you have to to add a link just note that you have to highlight the text you want to link and then you can you'll see that now I can click on it and I can add my link um, this is how you add images I'm gonna skip that for just one second we'll go into that in just a second um, this button makes it go in full screen mode so if I click now it's taking up the whole screen um, color change colors you can um, these are, you can indent paragraphs, undo and redo. So they're pretty, it's pretty basic editing um, icons. And if you ever forget what any of these icons are, you can sort of hover over them and it will tell you, insert special character. Okay, so that's that's a good thing about this WYSIWYG. A note about formatting is that you should always try to format your content in the WYSIWYG instead of like for instance some clients will have they'll start if they want to add a new page they'll circulate a draft in word and get everyone's approval on it and then once they get the approval they want to take it from the word document to the website well if you copy and paste from word or another program like that sometimes it adds weird html characters on the back end that you you know you may not even notice until you look at the code and word is sort of notorious for this so there's even a special button right here if you're going to paste from word you click on it and you paste your content from word so it doesn't include that weird html um, to be to be especially safe if you're going to copy and paste content it's best to use this paste as plain text button and it will completely strip out all of your formatting and you'll kind of start from scratch so let me show you an example of that so now i'm on tendency.com and I'm going to go to, let's go to this page. So you'll see there's some formatting here. It's got, you know, it's right align and it's got some images. So if I copy this and I go over to my demo site, let's put it here. And I hit paste plain text. So once that paste plate, I've clicked that button, you can see it's kind of indented. Now when I paste, it will paste everything plain text and you'll see that it didn't, here it is. It didn't include any of my formatting. It didn't include my image. It didn't include anything like that. So the I guess the, the caveat there is if you wanted it to look like it looked before, you're going to have to format it again. But the good thing is it doesn't it doesn't add weird HTML. It doesn't make you want to make sure your content's really consistent. And if you're copying and pasting things from other places, it may bring over weird fonts or colors or sizes or things that it's always best to kind of keep your formatting as simple as you can so that your website can be clean and it can be, you know, brand consistent and all those good things. So another note uh, in the WYSIWYG editor is if you're adding subheadings to a page. So say we want to add subheading, you know, our organization. You can give those, there are pre-coded styles in your, in your website and they're right here. See where it says paragraph and then you'll see these headings, heading one, two, three, all the way down to six. Um, these are, the good thing about using these heading styles is that it, makes all of your subheadings consistent. So if I say, okay, I want this to be a subheading and I make it a heading two, I want this to be a subheading, I wanna make it a heading two. It means that anytime you have something like that, it will all be completely consistent. Oh, it would help if I spelled subheading, right? Uh, it will all be consistent on the front end. The other thing it does, I'm, I'm flip over to HTML for just a second. So you'll see my subheading has these little H2s around it. That tells the search engines that, so if a search engine is crawling your site, it says, this is a subheading, this is important text, this is part of what the page is about. So it tells the search engines that this content is important. So the good thing about using subheadings is one, it keeps everything consistent on the front end, and two, it tells the search engines, this is what this content is about. So if you put, key, you know, if you have some keywords in your subheadings, then it tells the search engines that, that, that those keywords are what your content is about. Um, you don't, you'll notice I started with two. You don't want to use heading one because heading one, if I hit save, and it's going to spin for just one second. Okay. The heading one is actually what this about, what the title of the page is coded as a heading one. So every page should have just one heading one. And if you enter in a title on your page, that's automatically going to be the heading one. So you can kind of skip that. So you just start it, start at heading two. 
Um, so the other thing with the WYSIWYG is how to add images. And to add images, you click on this Insert Media button. And then it's thinking. And then from here, you can upload an image from your computer. And you'll notice that that button was called Insert Media. You can actually insert any kind of media through this function if you want to add a PDF or anything like that. So you'll see that the first thing I see are the images that I've added previously. Um, if I want to add a new image, I just click Upload Media. I go to my desktop, and I don't know. Let's see what, what images I have. OK, here's the tenancy logo. So if I hit open and then it goes, it spins. And then if I want to insert that image in my text, I just hit insert image. And then there it is down there. Um, one note, if you insert an image that's really large, let's see if I can find one that's big. I think this one is. If you insert an image that's really large, Tendency is going to automatically resize it to 400 pixels wide. And the reason we do that is just because your most most of our clients, uh, the width of how wide their content is, is not too much wider than that. And so we don't want to, you to add an image and it's gigantic on the page and you can't see it. So we just automatically kind of shrink it down to what is a generally good web size. Um, you can always make it bigger again. All you do is you click on it. So you'll notice when I clicked on that image, this little, my little icon got indented. So if I click back on that icon, now I can make changes to the image. So I can change the width. I, you know, I can make this 500 to maintain the, or to change the, the size of something and keep the proportions. You just change one of the numbers. So I changed 400 to 500, leave the second number blank and hit update and it will fix the second number. So I, you know, I can make it big again. This text right here, title text and alt text, that is again for the search engine. Search engines can't see images. So search engines can only see text. So we give it, we code it on the back end and we say, you know, this, this is the text of what this image is. So this is the Mountain View Chamber of Commerce. You may have noticed that by default, it's going to use the, the name, the file name. So just be aware that that's what it's going to plug in there because that's, you know, it says, oh, well, the file name, that should be somewhat descriptive, but probably whatever you type in there is going to be a little more descriptive. So again, you hit update image and it, and it updates. Um, you can do things like make it right aligned. This image is kind of big, so let's make the other image right aligned. So let's see, I stick it here. And once it's in there, you can drag and drop, copy and paste, you know, move it around, that kind of thing. So if we made it right aligned, and then these little boxes right here are padding for how much, how many pixels of, of padding the image has. So you'll see it has, I put a little bit of padding so that the text doesn't bump right up against it. So that's the WYSIWYG. If there are any questions on that, like I said, type them in the chat box. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I know we spent kind of a lot of time on it just because it's in almost every single module. So if you can... If you, if you get a feel for it now, you'll be you'll be ready to go in all the other modules. Um, just one other thing on the alt text, you'll see if I hover over the image that the alt text I added, Mountain View Chamber of Commerce, popped up. So that's how you can kind of check yourself. The tags here are when you add a tag to a page, I'll show you what it looks like. If I hit save, it adds a link at the bottom of the page to click on. If you click on that, you'll see any content that's tagged that way. That can be good for search engines as well. It's an opportunity to add keywords to your content. For some clients, they use tags in a way. Let me think of an example. Like on shipple.com, all of the content that is around company is tagged company, and then it shows up in this sidebar right here. So some some clients, some websites use tags in a way where the tags can then, you know, content tag that way is fed somewhere else. If your if your template, if your site is not using tags that way, then you can you really can just ignore the tags field. It's kind of up to you if you want to if you want to use that or not. It can be good for search engines. Again, you can add keywords, um, but if you're site is not really set up to feed in content based on tag, then feel perfectly free to ignore the tags field. One nice thing about this field is if you are using tags that way, like for instance, the, the company example, and you can't remember exactly what you're supposed to tag content, there's this little link that says open all tags in a new window, and it shows you all the tags that people are using across the site. So then you can kind of see like, okay, well this, you know, tendency demo, there's a lot of content tagged that way. There's a lot of, con you know, there's a lot of tendency demo. So that's probably what I should be tagging things. So you can, if you're trying to remember, like, do I tag this about or about us? You can, you can look. And also if you start to type something, it will recommend things that other people have already typed. So that's kind of a cool thing. 
Um, the template is just the, the, the look and feel of the page. Most sites have just one default template. This one has like a left sidebar. So this, you'll see this template has a right sidebar. They, we have a different template that's got a left sidebar. So like if I chose that template, then this page would be in that look and feel. So it would be the same, but it has a left sidebar. So it just depends again on how your site is set up, if your site has multiple templates or not. Um, permissions, this is, a, this is also the same on every single module. When you first create a content, um, you can make it private. If you uncheck this box, then only people logged in as super users can see it. So for instance, if you're working on content and you're not quite ready for it to be public and live, you can just uncheck this box and it will, you can save it and you can go back to it and look at it and share the link with people who have admin access, but it's not public, you know, it's not out there and, and anonymous people can't view it. So this is a public page, but if you'll notice when I uncheck public, I got a whole lot of more options there. Um, you can make it so only users can see the content, only members. If you have certain user groups, you can lock it down to like, if you have a board of directors group, you can add content just for the board of directors. And you know, only people in that user group are able to see the content. Anybody who has super user access can see everything, just to be aware. So just because if I'm a super user and not in the board of directors, I can still see this content. So, um, but you can use, you know, if you have certain committees or certain people that are able to see sort of private things, you can, you can do that. We're going to keep this public. Um, include an RSS feed. Every site has an RSS feed that's created automatically. That's just updates and content, new content to the website. Um, it's always good. I usually include everything in the RSS feed just because um, the search engines will index that as well. So it's sort of another way to make sure that your content gets found. Status, detail, active, inactive, and pending. This is if if this is at anything other than active, the public can't view it. So again, if you're trying to make something that's kind of in draft mode, you can make it inactive and then people can't see it. Um, category is very similar to those tags where if you have a site that's set up in a certain way so that your categories feed in, you know, on a sidebar or something like that, then you'll want to use categories, but otherwise categories are totally optional. Um, if you have a lot of content, sometimes categories can be a good way to categorize things. So you, if you're sort of looking, digging through your content or navigating through your content, but otherwise you're perfectly okay to skip them. Um, SEO meta, you'll see this. So there are three main SEO meta fields that are again coded on the back end. Only the search engines can see them. And there is the title field, the keyword field, and the description field. Tendency automatically creates, so if I'm going to hit save, um, and I can look at this, I'm going to go into the code a little bit. So this is the code of the page we are editing. You'll see this meta description, meta keywords, and then here's the title right here. Tendency, auto, you don't have to do anything. Tendency automatically creates those tags for you. But if you want to customize what those tags say, you can go in here and edit the meta and sort of overwrite what is. So this is what Tendency created by default, but you can overwrite that for yourself if you like. We actually have a whole webinar on, let me think of the best place. So if you go to Tendency, the Tendency help files, and I cheated, I just typed in tendency.com slash help, but remember it's under resources over here. If you go to search engine marketing tips and tools, there is a video optimizing your tendency website for SEO. And this is about an hour long, a 40, 40 minute long video on the automatic features, what tendency does with your SEO automatically, what you can overwrite, kind of what the, some tips for optimizing your content. So if you're looking into doing more search engine optimization, check this, this video out. It's a, it's a great resource. And down here we have the slides too, and the kind of an overview if you don't want to watch the whole video. So um, let me go back. So that is what the meta is. So I think those are all of the fields in pages. Again, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box. Let me see. Yeah, I think we went through all of it. Um, if you want to delete a page, you can delete it. I would recommend not deleting it, but actually just making it private and unlinking it just because you never know what content you might want to go back and, you know, even if it's it's last year's event and it's over now and you want to you want to remove the page. Well, next year, you're probably going to need similar content again. So I always recommend don't delete things, you know, just make them private if, if, if at all possible. So let's go into some other modules. I'm going to go back to my, my PowerPoint or my keynote. And just make sure we kind of got through everything. So this is how you add a page. Oh, I didn't talk about how to add a brand new page. Okay, we'll talk about that. 
Um, if you're going to add a brand new page, probably the easiest way to do it is to go here over content and pages and hit the little plus sign. Or if you're within, if you're editing a page under the tabs, you can click add page from there. Um, if you add a new page, So when I add my title and then I click into my second, my URL path, Tendency is automatically going to create a URL based on what your title is. And again, that's sort of part of the built-in SEO of Tendency is it says, oh, these are, the search engines can actually read with the hyphens in between that this, you know, that this page is about new page with a long title. And so it's sort of telling the search, you know, it's, it's creating that URL because it's a search engine friendly URL. But sometimes if your page has a lot of words in it, you might not actually want this big long URL, so you can overwrite it. We'll call it training page. And you can also change on any of these, you know, later and, and, and all of that. Um, so then you add your content. And then you'll see that by, you know, make sure it's public. I'm going to include it in my RSS feed. I'm going to make it active. I'm going to hit add page. So it's pretty much as simple as that. One thing to note is if you just because you added a new page doesn't mean that people are going to find it. So if you're if you do add a new page, so if you have a new service or a new, you know, put drive or a new staff member or a new something that you're adding, make sure that it's linked somewhere. With the, a lot of the other modules, like when you add an event, it automatically gets added to the calendar. You don't have to, you don't have to remember. Um, if you add a job, it automatically gets added to the job list. If you add an article, it gets added to your, you know, it automatically happens. But with pages is kind of the one thing that it doesn't automatically get added somewhere. So you want to make sure that you're linking, you know, if you're making a page about your new program, maybe it should go in the navigation or maybe it should go as a submitting or maybe it should go you know, maybe in your stories rotator. Just just keep in mind that just because you added a new page doesn't mean people are going to find it. So you probably want to link it in at least a couple of other places, even if it's just, you know, in the text of another page, just to make sure people are able to see it. So here are some help files on editing CMS pages, how to use the WYSIWYG, um, those pre-formatted styles we were talking about with the H1s and H2s. Here's just another uh, reiteration of that in this help file. Again, a tip about moving content from Word, make sure you paste plain text, how to add a new page. So now let's talk about um, editing the navigation. So speaking of when you add a new page, how do you, you know, making sure it's linked somewhere, how do you edit the navigation? For most of our sites, it's as simple as hovering over. So I'm logged in and when I hover over the navigation, you'll see this little edit nav bar pops up and I click on that. And so then from here, I can just drag and drop navigation. So I can move things around. I can pull things like in and out. So it's sort of like an outline where anything on the top level is going to be the top level. Anything underneath is going to be a sub level. Um, so you can just drag and drop things around. When you add a new page, this list over here is the, the CMS pages that are added to the site. So you should see one. So like here's our here's our page we added. We can click add selected pages and it's going to add it down here at the bottom and then you can sort of drag it around. We'll put it under donate. And then if I click the the title of it, I have more options I can change. So maybe new page with a long title is a little too long for my navigation. I want it to have a shorter title so that cuz I don't know if it's all going to fit in here. So we'll just call it training page. Oh, I changed the wrong one. Change the label. The title attribute is in the back end for the, for the search engine. So um, I usually just make them the same just to keep it simple. And then if I hit save, so under donate, here's my training page. So it's as simple as just dragging and dropping. Some clients have their navigation is built in HTML. I'll just go quickly through that. So if you're like, for instance, shipple.com is actually built in HTML. If it is, you'll go to Quick Links, Theme Editor, and then it will be called something like, usually it's called nav.html, and this is the this is the content. So you'll see that um, the easiest way to edit this, if you if your site is, if your navigation is in HTML, is what I usually do is I'll sort of have the site up side by side, and the part in green is the link, and the part in black is the text. So I'll say, okay, web design, web design. And then underneath that is custom web design, website development. Okay, underneath that is custom web design, website development. So if you need to change things or reorder things or move things around, you just take the whole line and like, you know, copy 
and paste the whole line. We'll kind of clean that up a little bit. Paste the whole line. So you can do things like that and make changes in here. If you have to make big changes, I would recommend contacting our support team and seeing if they can help you with that. Just because that way, if it, it can keep you out of, you know, if you don't want, don't feel comfortable in the code. The good thing about the tendency theme editor is you'll see it saves every single revision down here. So if you do make a mistake, you can always revert back to the last version and it will, you know, we, we always save all the versions. So if you're in the theme editor and you're, you're feeling worried about it, know that you can always kind of revert back to the last version if you make a mistake. It also does cool things like you'll see it's color coded. So if I accidentally leave off a character, You'll see how it turns red so it kind of tells me visually like oh no that's you know that's not correct so it the theme editor helps you a lot um, but again if you're not comfortable if you're if your navigation's in html you're not comfortable with that feel free to contact our support team and we're happy to help but i think most most of our clients especially a lot of the newer clients and uh they have got the the simple you know kind of hover okay edit the nav drag and drop keep it simple so that's editing the navigation. So just a reminder, when you're adding content to the site that it's, if you're adding a CMS page, it's not automatically gonna get linked. You need to kind of figure out where it should fit. And maybe it's in the navigation, maybe it's just cross-linked on another page. Like you don't have to add every single thing to the navigation, but just when you, when you need to, that's how you do it. So next we'll talk about the articles and the news modules. And those are very, very similar to the CMS, uh, the, or the pages module. So if you have, a, if you're using the news and articles modules, you probably have some kind of feed. Like for instance, on the demo site, we've got a latest news feed that feeds in the news. So when you add a news article, it's automatically gonna add to that feed. And if you go to the slash news news page, when you add a news article, it's automatically gonna show up here. So for news and articles, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to manually go link it somewhere. It's just automatically gonna show up and they're in order by the date they were published. So to add a new new news article or new news story, you can hover over the tab and hit add news, or again, and go to content, news, add a new guy over here. The only thing that really makes a news story or an article different than a page is instead of a title, it has a headline. And then instead of the URL path, instead of being demo.tendency.com slash whatever, it's demo.tendency.com slash news slash, and then my, my story. It also has a summary, which is just, that is what shows up in that feed of news. Um, when I'm looking at all of the news stories, that's what kind of shows up in the, in the list there. So if I open up my news feed again, just to show you what that looks like, it's what shows up here. So if you leave this summary field blank, it's just going to take the first couple of sentences. But if you want to spell, sometimes the first couple of sentences is not the best summary. So let's see, I'm going to add some content. Add some content and it's got the same WYSIWYG, the same formatting, the same, the same everything. Um, tags, uh, the news has a source. So for instance, if you're published in the media and you want to say, you know, here's a copy, here's the article that we were published and we were in the Chronicle. So I want to put the source there. You can do that. You can do the website, cron.com. And you can also pick a release date and time. So if this happened last week, I can actually say, oh, this happened, you know, on the 29th. Or uh, you, can, you can update it to when the news actually is officially released. You can also add a contact because a lot of times with press releases and things like that, you want to put the PR person, the marketing person's contact information, put that there. You have the same permissions as you did before and you just hit add news. And here's my beautiful news story. And when I click search news, now that one's at the top and you'll see the date. It's got the date that I, that I said that it was released. And then if I go to my homepage, my news story, oh, they both have the same headline, so that's not particularly helpful, but you'll see that it, it got added over here as well. And articles works almost exactly the same way. Content, oops, is it working? I don't know why this site doesn't have art, the articles module. Someone must have disabled it. Let's see. Let me. Oh yeah, here we go. Someone disabled it. You can also disable modules you're not using, which I don't, I, usually it doesn't hurt anything to have them enabled, but okay, we just enabled that. So now you'll see, I see articles over here. 
So um, articles is the same way. I just go add article. It's very similar to a CMS page. It's got a headline, a summary field, and a date. That's pretty much the biggest difference. As far as the difference between articles and news, a lot of clients and us internally as well, we use news for sort of formal press releases and we use articles for more informal, this came from us or um, things that are that are not quite as formal. So um, with news, we may do press releases or we may do like, you know, we were in the news or something like that. And then with articles, it's a little more like how to do X, Y, Z thing or, you know, trends in in web marketing or, or that kind of thing. So that's usually how we distinguish them. It just depends. Like, for instance, this website news is feeding into the homepage. So probably they're going to use news a little more. It's just sort of up to you what which module you want to use. Again, if there are any questions, feel free to type in the chat box. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep rolling through because we have a lot to get to, but feel free to um, type questions if you have them. So here's just again, and I'll send this out as a PDF how to edit an article. If you have an article that already exists, you scroll down to the bottom and click the edit button. That's pretty like I said, pretty much the same in all tendency modules. News releases work almost exactly the same way. So let's talk about the stories module now. The stories module is if you have some sort of rotator on your site, it uses what we call the stories module. And the stories are, it's just a very flexible module that you can add little kind of snippets of content all around your site. So like this big rotator is a story, um, but it can look like a lot of different things. So for instance, if we're on shipple.com, these little guys up here on the top, these are actually stories as well. And some clients use for their sponsors rotator, their sponsors rotator will be, they'll use the stories module as well. So just any time that you want to be able to add, like I think of it, like I said, sort of snippets of code that's got maybe an image and a link or image and text and a link. It's like, this is a story. These are stories. This is a story. Um, that's the stories module. The most, I'm going to close these extra windows. I have a lot of windows open. Okay. <laughs> so the, uh, the most common use of that is for this sort of big rotator image. And the way that you add a story is you go over to content, click on stories, and that will show you all the stories within your site. Um, with stories, each story, let's go to this one has an image. It has a title about us. It has content, it has an image and it has a link. So let me open this in a new tab. So here's my image, here's my title, here's my text, and if I click, I get a link. And none of those, those fields are not required. So like I said, for some examples, it's they use it to rotate through pictures of their sponsors. And maybe there won't be text next to it or there won't even be a link. It's just all, the, all they need are the pictures and they need it to rotate. And so those fields aren't required, but generally it looks kind of like this where there's an image and text and, and a title and a link. So you give it the title about us, you put the content, the content goes here, and then where the link goes. So the link, in this case, it goes to a page within the site. Anytime you see where, you know, it doesn't have the HTTP demo.tendency.com, the whole full URL, that's called a, this is called a relative URL. And what this means is it tells your browser, you know, don't go to a different domain, just stay on this domain and go to slash about. So it, and the good thing about doing that is, for instance, if your site is in development, you probably have a URL like, you know, development site dot tendency dot me, which is not going to be the final URL of where your site's really going to live. So if, and when you're in development, it's really important to make sure your links are all relative because then when we switch the domain, we don't have to change any of the links. So if you're linking to just slash about, then whether your site is, you know, demo dot tendency dot dev site dot whatever, you know, or whether once it actually goes live in its tendency.com, it doesn't really matter because you're you're linking in a, in a relative way instead of telling it, it, the opposite of that is what we call an exact URL, which is something like, you know, this, where it's got the full on URL. So that's just what that means when you see that. And you can do either one in this, oops, in this example. Um, you add a photo, you can, if you need to change the photo, the tags are important because the tags are a lot of, for a lot of sites, for instance, with this site, it doesn't show up in the rotator until you tag it rotator. 
And so that's just something to be aware of. And each site is a little bit different. Most of the time, you know, if we're using the stories module in multiple places, like my example where for PRSA Houston, they use it in the main stories rotator. They also use it for their sponsors rotator. The tags are a way that you can, we can tell the website, like, put this image in this place. So if it's tagged rotator, it goes in rotator. If it's tagged sponsors, it goes in sponsors. If you forget what your tags are supposed to be, my recommendation is to go look, oh, if I can click on it, go look at your list of stories that you have already. And then you'll kind of see what they're tagged. So you can see like, oh, this one's tagged rotator and this one's tagged sponsors and this one's tagged rotator. So you can kind of tell what um, you know, remember what, what you're supposed to tag them as. Or if you have, a lot of times also with clients will recommend just creating a quick Google Doc that you share with your team internally. And just as a reminder, you know, things tagged this way go here and things, you know, this is the size of the images and this is about how much text you get and that kind of thing. So it's sort of up to you um, how formal you want to be with it. But my trick is if I can't remember what the tag is supposed to be, I'll just go look at the last couple and see what they're tagged. Speaking of images, it's always best, Tendency will do its best to resize images to fit the space that the stories are supposed to go in. So for instance, here, you know, these are big, wide, horizontal images. Tendency is going to, if you uploaded a, like a portrait vertical image, Tendency is going to do its best to make it fit here and it's going to blow it up and crop it weird and it's going to look funny. So you always want to try to crop your images before you upload them so that your images are the exact right size of what they need to be. And I know that's not always possible, but it's always better if, if, if at all possible to crop your images. Um, again, if you forget what size image, your project manager should tell you what size image your images for your stories rotator are. If you forget, you can, my trick is if you right click and click inspect element, and I'm in Chrome. So this is, uh, Chrome has this feature and uh, Firefox has this feature where I can right click on it. And you'll see right here, this is my image. So it, when I right clicked, and I clicked inspect element, it highlighted down here, oh, this is what you're looking at. When I hover over it, see how it says 820 by, oh no, sorry, it's not that one, it's the first one. 922 by 450 pixels. That is the size of the image. I guess that one's not exactly the right size. That's weird. No, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong. It's 820 by 400 pixels, that's right. So look and see what the size of the images you had previously are and see like, okay, so those are the dimensions that I should be using. So you can do that here or you can do that in your list of stories. If I click on the story, I can open, I can look at the image. I have to click edit. It's gonna crop it as a square in that view. But if I click it here, there's my image. So you'll see it'll tell me, um, Oh, I see. The original image is 960 by 440, but they're not, they're not, they're actually too big. We're uploading things that are too big. So we're not following our own advice, which is, um, you know, that's because then you run into to weird things where it's going to crop it funny. So always try to make it the size of the image that it, that it um, will end up being. Like I said, that's my trick is inspect element, hover over, and you'll see it says 820 by 400. So that is the stories module. Um, like I said, the stories module is very, very flexible. So it can look at, so this site, like this featured sponsor over here, that's actually using the stories module to feed that in that place. So the stories module is really flexible. And so again, it sort of depends on how it's being used on your, on your website. Another thing with the stories module that I forgot to mention is that you can make these expire. So if you have an event that's coming up and you want to promote an event and the event's happening tomorrow or, you know, next week or next month, you can set it so that your story, ro your rotator image kind of rolls off and stops showing when your event is over. So you don't have to remember to add it. You can just make it expire. Um, you, If you want to make your your image expire, you have to check the expires box and then it will take this into account. If it's unchecked, it will just never expire. So just be aware of that. I do this, for instance, on our website when we have, you know, the office is closed for Thanksgiving break. So I'll, I just add all the holidays sort of all, of, all at the beginning. And then I'll say, okay, a few days before, put this stories rotator up that says, as a reminder, our offices are closed and on Sunday night, automatically take it down and I don't have to remember to do it. It just kind of does it for me. So if there are any questions on that, feel free to type them in the chat box. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going to the next, to the next module. So here are just some examples of, of a bunch of stories in action, how to add, there's a help file right here on how to use the stories module. 
So let's get into some other content. Let's go to the events module next. So the calendar events module is one of my favorite features of Tendency. It's similar to news and articles and that kind of thing where if you add an event, it automatically adds it to this nice pretty calendar. It makes a calendar for you. Um, it is this calendar. We actually pushed out an update last week or this week. I'm not sure if it's pushed out yet. Let's see. There it goes. Yeah, so the calendar is actually mobile friendly now. So when I resize my screen all the way down to a phone size, the calendar actually still functions and still works and, and all of that. So that's an update that we pushed out where we made it a little bit easier to use in a phone setting. Okay, make it big again. So when you add a calendar event, let's go to, let's edit an event that exists. Let's go to the company picnic. When you add an event, it gets a title, it gets a description. You can put whatever description you would like in this event. You've got the same WYSIWYG. You can add images. You can have people download a PDF. You can do, you know, whatever content you need to put in the description. This is totally open-ended. The event has a start date and a start time. If the event happens over a week or so, you can say, you know, it, it happens on the weekend or not. It has a time zone. Um, the priority, you'll notice when we clicked on this, it had this little yellow star. That's because we, uh, we checked the box for priority. It has a type. So the type is actually what makes the color coding on the events. So each type has its own event or each type has its own color associated with it. So this, when you pick a, when you pick a type, then it gets color coded on the, on the calendar. To edit your types, you just, in the tab over here, hover over, scroll down to where they are, event types. And you'll see here are all our types and then you can pick a color board meeting, staff holiday. Um, by default, when your site gets launched, it will have a whole bunch of types in it, just as an example to show you. If there's an, a type, an event type in here that you're not using, as long as there's not an event attached to that type, it won't show up on your calendar. So just because if you know if you go in here and you have a whole bunch of types, they, they may or may not actually show up on your calendar until there's an event attached to them. Um, also, anytime you look at this page on the bottom, there'll be two blank ones. You can add more than that. You can add as many event types as you want. But what the way the tendency works is like if I add new event type and let's make it turquoise and I hit save, it's going to save that and it's going to add two more at the bottom. So every time you hit save, it's just going to add two more at the bottom. And then again, you can change the colors. You can do, you know, you can delete them. You can do whatever you need to do over here. And T4, the event types determine the pricing. So each event type had its own pricing. And if you wanted the pricing to work in a certain way or cost a certain amount, you had to, so, you know, you had to make all the, you had to make a special event type just for that pricing. In T5, we've made it a lot more flexible where the event types are pretty much just categories with colors. And then each event can be completely kind of customized to whatever, whatever you need. So now when I go to the event calendar, you'll see my color coded, my color coded uh, content over here. So let's go back to our company picnic. So down here, we've also got, we've got the type, we've got um, group is a field that similar to the tags and the categories and the things where some clients have a specific group. So for instance, some of our professional associations, they'll have like a, a young professionals group and you can add, you can say, well, this group is associated with the, you know, the young professional or the board of directors. And then I can have a landing page for the board of directors that feeds in all of the content associated with that group. If you're not using that feature, then you'll probably have a group called, you know, just whatever the name of your site is, and you can just associate everything with the group. So the name of this is demo site. So there's a group called demo site. We just sort of associate everything with the demo site. So um, if you're not using that feature, you can skip group. It is a required field. So we usually just, like I said, just make a group with the name of the site and keep it simple. External URL is if you are registering, if the site registration doesn't actually happen on tendency, it happens somewhere else. You can copy and paste that URL so for instance, if you're plugging an event for a, a partner of yours or some, a, a, somebody that you work with closely, you can put their event on your calendar and then use this external URL. And when the person hits register, they'll go to the other site and not, you know, because the registration is not actually happening on your site, but you can still help promote it. Photo is optional. That's sort of based on the template. Some templates feed in a photo. Most of them don't. So you can skip that. Same tag, same, pers uh, same permissions, same thing. Um, if I hit save, 
Oh, I'm editing one, not adding one. So one thing we've also added is that this used to be one big long list. So you'll see there's overview, location, organizer, speakers. There's all sorts of options in here. Um, at one point in time, this was a one big long form, but for we are sort of slowly rolling out, making it separate pages so that you can kind of, it's a little bit easier to get through. You know, you do one part of it at a time. So you're, when you hit edit on your, you know, if you're adding events on your site, it might be one long page instead of the tabs, but some of the, um, we're kind of rolling out this tabbed interface. So for the location, you can choose, it will remember any locations you used previously, and you can click on those and they'll plug in the data, or you can add, you know, you can make this blank and you can add whatever location you want. Put the name of the location. All of these are optional fields. So pretty much the only thing that's required is the name of the event, the date and time, and that's and the you know the permissions, and that's about it. So all of these other things are just however much data you want to add to your events, you can. You can add information about the organizer if it's a certain organization that's you know if you're partnering with another organization. You can add speakers if it's a luncheon and you have a featured speaker. You can actually add multiple speakers. If I hit add speaker, it will add a whole bunch of speakers. You can make somebody the featured speaker. You can upload their headshot. Um, if you saw when you registered for this class, we use that field. So here's my speaker bio with my name and my, my headshot on there. And then the registration information is you can you can add events to your calendar that are not don't enable you know don't need people to register for them. For instance, if you have like a you know, an open house that people don't have to register for, or if it's just a, you know, reminder that the office is closed or something like that, that you, people don't actually have to register for, you just unclick this button and then that will take away the registration component. But if you do want people to register, check the box, you can give it a, a, a maximum number of registrations. If you have like capacity of a room or if you put zero, then it will be unlimited. You can pick what payment methods that you allow. Some of our clients allow people to register online and then come pay by, you know, by check or by cash at the door. A lot of times we will not allow that. We'll just say, you know, you have to pay online. If you're going to register online, you need to pay online because I don't want to have to go track you down for your check. So it's up to you how you want to let people pay. And again, you can customize it per uh, event. You can make it so that the payment is required before they're registered. So even if I say you have to pay by credit card, Sometimes, occasionally, people will um, they'll register for an event, and then it will, the way the tendency works is then when the payment part happens, it sends them to your payment, your uh, gateway merchant account provider. So for instance, somebody like an authorized.net or somebody like that, it sends the person to authorized.net to pay, and then when they're done paying, it sends them back to tendency and says, okay, yes, that worked, they paid. So the payment processing actually happens on the merchant account. But if for whatever reason, their credit card is declined or it doesn't go through or, you know, whatever, things like that. Um, they may have registered for the event with tendency, but the payment part didn't go through. So this checkbox just says, okay, in the event that somebody registers, but something weird happens with their credit card and they don't actually get, you know, the payment doesn't get accepted, then is their registration valid? So you can kind of pick if that's, you know, something that, that you want or not. It's checked by default. That's sort of what we recommend, but you can, you know, you have, you have the option. This require guests info. When someone's registering for an event, they can check a box that says, you know, I'm bringing a guest with me. And it adds, you know, it's, it asks for the guest information, but it's not required because you, by default, because you have the, you know, you have the first person's information. So it's sort of, you know, if two or three people come, as long as you have somebody's information, or if you check this box, then they do have to fill out exactly who those guests are. Um, discount eligible, I'll show you how the discounts work. Um, free pass, isn't, you can ignore, that's a, um, it's, it's, it's a custom module that we're working on, that we're testing on the demo site. You can publicly show registration stats. Um, you can have it send an email reminder to attendees however many days in advance, like seven days or one day. You can edit what that reminder email says. If you click on this over here, you can edit, you know, exactly what that email reminder is going to say. There's tons of options here. Um, this registration email text, you can customize what the registration email says. So for instance, on this webinar today, I'm actually not logged in, but I'm logged in in this browser. Uh, edit event. I added a 
I added a custom registration email. So it said, here's, you know, here's the GoToMeeting info. So when you registered, you got this um, sort of automatically. And then the last step is pricing. So we set up all of our registration. Now, how much do these people, are they going to pay? So a pricing, it's its sort of weird how a, a pricing is sort of like a pricing level. So each pricing level is called pricing. So you may have early bird pricing that is $10 and it has a start and an end date of, you know, if you register before December 1st, you can pay $10. And then regular pricing is from December 1st forward, you pay, you know, maybe we do like $15. So you can add different pricing levels. You can make one, um, it, each one also has their own permissions, like the public can use this, or you have to be signed in, or you have to be a member. So you could make member specific pricing. So like maybe member pricing is $10, no matter when you register, you know, from here up until the event, if you're a member. Oops, not 150. And then when you hit save, you'll see here's our description, here's our title, here's our when and where, here are our pricing options we added, here's our uh, tendency automatically makes this Google map for you. So you just add the address and it creates this Google map. It also automatically adds this Facebook like button. It shows me, I'm logged in, so it shows me how many spots are left, if I've already registered for this event. Um, if I was going to register, I just hit the register button and then I pick which pricing level and I fill out the form. And it's just pretty basic information. Here's my add another registrant. So this is where if I said, you know, you must include the registrant's information, it will it will require these fields. Or if I did not check that box, it will just let me say, you know, I've got one person's information, so that's enough. So that is the calendar events module. Um, a lot of other, there are a lot of other features of the calendar events module. There are things like for any given event, you can search and see who's registered for that event. You can also email those people. So I can, you know, I can look at this this way, or I can go to what we call the roster report. This is an ugly report that is ugly on purpose because it's designed to be printed. It's a printable report um, that shows you exactly who's registered and, you know, if they've paid or not what their balance is, like this person paid and they, you know, they registered for $10 and they didn't actually pay. So they have $10 open and, and um, pending or their balance. Um, it also does cool things like if you're up at the front desk while an event is happening, if somebody shows up, you can check this box and it adds a timestamp. So it says, you know, this guest showed up at this time. And then later you can go back and look and see, you know, either export this data or go and look and see who actually attended your event versus just registered or RSVP'd for it. So this report is very cool. Let's go back. You can also email everybody who has registered this email registrant. So I use that this morning and I did my as a reminder, you know, you registered for this event. If you want to include information about parking or about changes or anything like that, you can just email everybody. If you hit send, it will email everyone. You can also pick just the people who've paid or just the people who have, maybe somebody registered, but they haven't paid yet. They're going to pay at the door. You can say, you know, as a reminder, don't forget to bring your check. You haven't paid yet. You know, you're on my list kind of thing. Um, the events calendar also has a, has a monthly calendar view and it also has a list view. So if you have a ton, ton of events, sometimes it's easier to look at things at this, from this list view and it just shows things, you know, chronologically in what order that they're, they're coming up in. So for some of our clients, if they have tons and tons of events, they prefer this view. You can also look at past events and see what happened in the past. You can filter this report by certain types. So you'll see if I filter by, let's do staff holiday and hit search. My URL up here changed. Well, I guess this isn't really a good example. Let's try to find one that has stuff. There it is. So then you can actually use this URL and you could send this to someone and say, hey, here are all the events with this certain event type. So the events calendar is really flexible. Let me go back over to my keynote and make sure I got everything. Here's more about event types. Here's more about adding content. Here's more about registration and what options you have. And then here are some help files. And with the because the event calendar is sort of complex. It has a whole lot of features. We actually have a few video help files on here. So if you forget, you know, what did she say? What button was I supposed to click on again? You can go to these video help files and sort of watch it again. Any questions on events, feel free to type in the chat box. I am um, 
we're going to, I'm going to move on to the next module, if not. Okay. So the next modules we're going to talk about are photos and videos. Photos and videos are sort of rich media modules that are built into Tendency. So the photo albums module, this is where you can upload, upload photos to your website. If you have a feed on the home page like this site does where it feeds in the photos, then whatever photos you add are automatically going to be, you know, fed into your, fed into your site. So to add a photo album or to add photos, first you add an album and then you add photos within that album. So if I hit add photo set, sorry, photo set, I'll give the photo set a name. I give it a description. You can add HTML in here too. So we could do like tendency.com and that will convert that into, or you can add links and it will convert them into a, you know, a clickable link. Again, it's going to make you pick a group but we can, you know, we have sort of a demo site generic group. You can add tags to the photo album or the photo set. Let's do um, tendency, tendency demo. Like you can have the same permission options, public can view, advanced permissions, active or inactive. And when I hit add, it's going to take me to a screen where I can add photos. So I just select the photos from my, from my computer. Let's do, we'll do some photos of the new, the new tendency sign. And you'll see it's going to, it's going to roll through the photos and update, upload them. These are photos, I think, from my phone. So they're pretty small. If you have photos you've taken on a DSLR, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to get uploaded. One thing to note, I always recommend if you are uploading photos from like a DSLR camera is to export them in a way that they're not don't upload the originals just because those files are so huge. It's going to take a long time to upload them to your site. And so if you can export them or, you know, size them down to like a, uh, a medium or sometimes even, even the large size is going to be not as nearly as big as the original. So keep them as sort of a web friendly size uh, when you upload them. It's going to make that process a lot faster because otherwise it's going to have to upload every single gigantic file before it, before you get here. So just a word to the wise. Um, this is the photo editing screen. It's a batch edit or bulk edit the photos. So I can replace all of the titles. And you'll see as I typed it, updated the title over here. It's going to update all of the titles. And then you can give it a caption. Um, you can do tags, photographers. It has licenses. These are all rights reserved means no one can use your photo. Um, these down here are Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons, if you upload a photo and make it Creative Commons, then... For instance, attribution means that someone else can use your photo. They just have to attribute it to you. They have to link back to you or say that it came from your organization. We do our photos. We make our photos attribution. And our photos have actually been published. Um, Ed, our CEO, is a fantastic photographer. He's been published in newspapers. He's had photos in textbooks. And, you know, it all it says. And he, and then it says, you know, this photo is by Tendency or by Shipple. And it's sort of more kind of press for us. So attribution is a really, is a really powerful thing if you let people, especially if you have a big event and you want the news media to be able to use your photos, if you tag them as attribution, then it's more likely that they're going to get picked up because it's just really easy for, you know, somebody to cover your event and use your photos and say, you know, photo by your, your organization. And they will, they do have to credit you. They have to tell, you know, a lot of times they'll link back to you, which again can be good link juice for SEO and all that good stuff. So my trick for editing, speaking of SEO, um, Search engines don't know what photos are about. They can't see what this is a photo of. And so uh, it's it's good to fill out the title and add a caption and add something unique for each photo just so that each one gets a little bit of that SEO love. Because if they all have the same title and the same caption, then to the search engines, they're all going to look the same and it might look like duplicate content. So what I usually do is I will start with replacing all the titles, replacing all the captions, and then I'll go in and just make small changes. So then I can be like, oh, this is a group photo. And this is like tendency and shipple signs, or this is, you know, Ed and Caitlin holding the shipple sign or with the tendency sign. So I'll usually kind of start with my bulk editing and then go in and make small changes so that they're not all exactly the same. You can also change which one is the album cover. You can delete them from here. You can change things individually. If you hit save changes, it, save, it saves your changes. Um, 
So then from here, you can also go into an individual photo and edit it from here and do one at a time if that's easier. So the videos module is similar to the photos module, but it's different in that it, when you add a video to your site, it doesn't actually live in tendency. So let's see if it's linked anywhere, it's slash videos. So this video gallery is really these videos live on YouTube, but they are sort of embedded in your tendency site. So this is a YouTube video, but it lives in a really nice gallery on your site. And the good thing about that is that people, a lot of people watch videos on YouTube, but if they watch their video on your site, they're kind of surrounded by your branding. You don't have to send them away. They don't have to leave your, the same thing with photos. People love to look at photos on like Facebook, but it's, if they can be looking at the photos within your website, then they're, you don't have to send them away. You can keep them on your website. Uh, so what a lot of times what we'll do is we'll add all of the photos in our tendency photo album. And we may add, you know, a few of the best ones on Facebook. And when on our Facebook, for instance, on our tendency Facebook page, if I go to photos, let me find it. Oh, so here's Via Calori. So we added an album called Via Calori, and we just put a few. We put 12 photos up, and then we said, see all of the photos here. And when I click over there, it's about, you know, it's 76 photos worth of content. So we'll put kind of some of them on Facebook because we know people love to look at photos on Facebook, and then we'll add all of them on Tendency because the hope is that as they're flipping through these photos on our Tendency website, and I got excited and clicked too soon and confused it. Okay. If they're looking at photos on our tendency website, they're sort of surrounded by our branding. They're looking at our, you know, they're looking within our content. So the videos module is very similar. So this is actually a YouTube video, but they're looking at it on your website. To add a new video, you go to videos and you add. And then all you have to do is give it a title. Oops, video example. It has a URL, you put it in a category, and then you just copy and paste the YouTube URL. So it's literally as easy as, you don't have to create the embed code, you don't have to do, you don't have to do any of that. You just take, oops, I don't want it in a list. Here we go. Here's an example. So I'm just gonna copy this URL, paste it over here, I can give it tags if I want. I can give it a description if I want, which I'll add a little bit of something just so you can see what it, what it looks like. Make it public and then hit save. And then Tendency automatically will create the, you know, they'll make it the right, it'll make it the right size. It will add the description content. It will add it to when I click on, when I go to the videos module, it shows up on the top. You know, it will do all of that for you. You just have to kind of copy and paste the, um, the URL. And this videos module uses, it, it uses a plugin called Embedly, which allows YouTube, Vimeo, pretty much any of the major video providers, you, you can just copy and paste the URL. And it even does SlideShare, which is where we upload our presentations. So I can actually say, okay, here's my most recent SlideShare presentation. I can copy and paste this link and it will embed it just the same. So any, pretty much any video or media source, um, you can just copy and paste the URL and it will create that content. So that is photos and videos. Like I said, the biggest advantage of that is that people are looking at your, people love to look at rich media. They're doing it within your website. You don't have to send them away. So the next module that we're gonna look at is the job board. The job board is slash jobs. So for our association clients or membership organizations, they'll allow their members to add jobs. So maybe if you're, you can actually charge money for jobs if you would like to. So, you know, PRSA Houston, if you're not a member, you pay, you know, $100 for two months. And if you're a member, you get half the price because it's a member benefit. So you can do all kinds of things like that with jobs. Um, for not all of our clients use it that way. You can also just use jobs as a job board internally for your organization. That's what we do internally for our organization. Um, regardless of how you use it, you do have to set up a price. So if you go to slash jobs, you'll see this pricing tab. You do have to set up pricing 
But if you're just using it as a regular job board for your organization, just make all the pricing zero because you're the only one who will be adding content. But if you are using the job board to make money for your organization, you can set up, you know, for this for 30 days. If you are, it's cost ten dollars. If premium means that it's highlighted and kind of at the top of the list, you can pay twenty. If you're a member, you only have to pay five. Um, if you're a member who wants premium, you have to pay ten. You can kind of set up whatever rules that you want. And then you can give it a timeline and hit submit. So you do have to set up pricing when you're using the job board. But like I said, if you're just using it for internal jobs, just make all your pricing zero and, and you can kind of keep it simple. So to add a job, job, the job board is similar to the events module where you have tons and tons of options. Like if I scroll down, there's just tons and tons of fields that you can fill out. But the only ones, literally the only fields you have to fill out are the title and the URL. So you can say, you know, job position job position. I mean, the description field is not even required. The jobs field is, or the jobs module is very flexible in that you can add whatever content makes sense for your organization. So we'll add a little description. You can add a URL if it if it's linked somewhere else. You can add what day the position starts on. You can give it a code if your organization has internal codes for things. You can put a location, add skills, computer skills, experience, education. You can add all of this, who the position reports to, how they should contact you, all of that. That's all completely optional depending on what, what you need. We usually, when we add jobs, we just do title, description, maybe starts on, and that's, that's about it. And we'll just put all of that content in the description. But we have lots of different fields. And the reason we do that is because if you fill out that content, it just, it's, a, it's sort of a template for you so that it makes it easy. If you want to fill out your content that way, you can just go fill out skills, education, contact method, and, and there's a place for it. And it's structured nicely and it's going to look good and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to stress out about it. Um, and then you've got the duration. So this is where those pricings come into those pricing options come into play. Again, if you're if you're doing it internally, just make them zero dollars. You can add pricing options straight from here. Um, you can give it an activation date and an expiration date. So if you want to, you want the job to you know appear on Monday. I don't want it to appear yet. I want it to appear on Monday at eight a.m. and then I want it to go away on you know in two and a half weeks at four p.m. You know you can make whatever. Um, oops, I clicked the wrong button. 4 p.m. and then the post date and time. Let's do 8 a.m. on. So you can you can schedule these to go up to be activated at certain times. You can put your contact information in there, and then the same permissions field. So the job board is extremely flexible. If you are using this for your organization to make money for your organization, for instance, for membership organizations, the You'll, you'll probably want to have it set with a pricing that has, um, it costs money. And then if somebody goes in, if they're logged in, a super user can always add a job. They don't have to get approved or anything like that. They don't even have to pay. I mean, they can override the pricing because they're a super user. But if a member logs in and adds a job, it's going to go into pending status. And it's going to send the admins an email and say, there's a, there's a job posted. It's in pending status. Here's where you go approve it. Even if the person's paid, it will go into pending. And then you can go look at pending jobs. There's one right here, test. And you can see which ones are pending and you can go and like sort of review them and then approve them or not. So that's the job sport. There's also a resumes module, which is very similar where people can upload their resumes um, and you can add it. You can add your own. You probably, if you're just using it internally, you probably wouldn't upload your own. But if you're a membership organization, you can allow people to upload their resumes and have that sort of out there if they're if they're looking for a job or they're looking for a new position. So I'm going to flip back over to my keynote. So we looked at the job board. Oh, the next module that we're going to look at, actually skip this one. I, I went through jobs first. So there's the job board. Here's a little bit more about managing jobs. Okay. So we're going to go into business directories. The business directories module is over here under directories. And essentially what the, that is, is you can have a directory of different organizations that maybe are partners, or if you're a membership organization, maybe you're, you're member organizations. And instead of people, it's built to be sort of businesses or organizations or that kind of thing. So when you add a new directory, 
again, it's got pricing just like the job board because it's sort of built that if if an organization wants to use it to add revenue to their um, to their organ, you know, they want to charge money for these for these directory listings, they can. Or if you're not using it that way, just set your pricing to zero. So they've got a headline, it's got a URL path, it's got body description, it's got a logo because they've got it sort of built to be a be a business directory. It's got an activation date, it's got tags, um, and then sort of the payment information. So you'll see that in tendency, if something is bolded, that means it's required. But if it's not bolded, that means it's not required. So you'll see lots of not bolded fields, again, on here, where you can fill them out if you want to or you don't have to. And then organizations will use this, like, I think that HTC uses this. They have um, an accelerator program where they work with startups. And so their sort of sub, um, their startups are in a directory or their partners or the you know, organizations that they work with are in um, are in a directory. And you can use the categories to break down, you know, what type of organization. I think PRSA Houston uses it as well. Yeah, so you can see these are different partner organizations that have um, paid to be a part of their directory, and you can look at the categories and see is it a you know PR firm and what is the subcategory and um, search for their for their um, through their directory. Then the next module we're going to look at is the locations module. The locations module is built so that you can add different location information. For instance, if you have several locations, um, you can add a different you can add information about each of them. So for instance, you can give it a name, you know, you can have like your Houston headquarters. You can add a description. You don't have to fill out latitude and longitude. You can upload a logo. You can, you can add the, the location information and you hit save changes. And then it cre automatically creates a map. And when you go to the list of locations, it shows up in your list of locations. A client that uses this pretty extensively is the YMCA of Houston. So they have 34 branches and they put all of their branches in as a location. So you can see information about them, the address, the phone number. Um, you can search by city, you know, I'm in Katy. And you can see which ones are close to you or you can type in a go to nearest locations and you can type in your zip code and it will show you which ones are, are closest to you. So this one, the A is me and the B is that um, organiz or that location. So you can actually do like a zip code lookup using this module as well. This is really helpful if you're like the YMCA who has many, many locations. If you just have one or two, um, it is a kind of a nice way to display those, those one or two locations, but it's probably not as um, you know, you don't you don't need all of you don't have so many that you need to be able to like sort through them quickly. Let's see. I think we're getting into the end here. So we went through the locations module. Um, yes. Okay. So we just have a few. We just have a few more modules to go through. The next one is the files module. Any file that you upload. So if you upload to an image or to a to a CMS page, you add an image. If you upload any kind of file, it gets saved in this files module, and it will show you which. So this one was uploaded via this directory. Um, this directory page. Let's see. This one was uploaded via this page. You can see who and who what user uploaded these things. And so any file will get saved here. So if you're looking for a logo of something, you can actually go search and see if you, if you need to go back and find that image again. One thing to note is that when you upload a file, it's going to give it the title of its um, its file name. You can actually edit that and give it a, give it a name that is more easy to read, you know, like logo for AIME. So then now if you were to search it, if you search logo for AIME, it would find it. So you can actually label these things in a kind of more friendly way, but by default, it's just going to use the file name. Um, you can also, another cool thing about the files module, this is a good way to just sort of see what, if you're looking for content that you've uploaded before, or if you're, you know, you're uploading something and you want to, um, sometimes I use this, if I need to send someone a link to an image, I'll upload it to the files module and then I can just send them the link from here. It also does interesting things like, 
in tendency when you upload so if when I hover over this I don't know if you can see but in the bottom left it says then the path is demo.tendency.com slash file slash an ID number so slash 68 so each of the files are listed with a, a number so even when I embed an image in a CMS page it actually let's see if I can find one oh I clicked on the wrong button it actually uses the image number. So if you were to say you uploaded a PDF with a form and you need to make changes to that form, you can actually, you don't have to, you know, remember every place that you've linked or used that PDF. You can edit the file. And so see, even though this, this file name has this big, crazy long name, when, it, when it's linked in tendency, it's going to have the ID number. So I can actually change the file, the actual file that it is attached to and hit save. And that changed the image, but it didn't change the, the location of the file. So if, for instance, if I've linked to a PDF in 10 places, I can go to the files module and overwrite and add my new PDF. And then I don't, ha I don't have to change the link anywhere. It automatically, because it uses the exact same link as long as I do it this way. So as long as you go and you find the file and you change it on that same ID, it's not going to, um, you don't have to go in and change the image or change the link as well. So that's kind of a cool thing about the files module and also just sort of a list of um, what files are on your site. You can actually, under files, you can look at the most viewed and see which ones are the most viewed. So which ones people have downloaded the most. So this intro to tendency PDF is the one that's been downloaded the most um, in this timeline. So you can look at some, you know, things like that as well. So I think that the last thing that I wanted to talk about is users and tendency. So those are pretty much all of the modules. We went through a lot of them. You'll like invoices is a module, but that's really just attached to payments. And if you click on invoices, you'll see all of the payments attached to the other. It's not really, it's not something that you'll be going in and like adding new invoices yourself. It's just going to kind of record anytime someone registers for an event or something like that. It's going to show up in the invoices module. Let's see what else in here. Um, the redirects module is one that you can add if you need to add a redirect. So for instance, we wanted to send slash donate to slash donations. You just go to add a redirect. What is the from URL and the to URL and you hit add. It's really simple. So there's some sort of like admin tools in here. Um, but we covered most of the modules. For users, if you add, so under people, you'll see members. And again, members is sort of a separate training. So I'm not really going to get into members. But if you need to add a new user to your site, for instance, if you need to add a new super user, if you have someone who comes on staff, we'll add, we'll add a test account, a uh, staff member. All you have to do is you go up to people, users, add. They need a first name and a last name and an email address. And that's just so they can retrieve their password if they um, you know, so they have a record associated in the database so that if they need to retrieve their password, it has an email it can send them. And then you can give them a username and a password, or you can just click use auto generated password. Um, and the system will create a password for them. And then if you want to make them a super user where they can make whatever edits on the site that you want, then you just check super user and then that you'll will add your new person. Um, oh, what's it mad about? Oh. oh, it doesn't like my, it automatically filled in the password. There you go. So here's my, there's my user and you'll see underneath it says super user. So if you need to add a new person, you can do it that way. We do recommend adding each individual staff member or each person as their own user, just because when we track, tendency tracks what we call event logs and it actually shows, we can go back and see who edited what and you can look at a page and see who created it and who edited so who edited edited it last and you know who submitted a contact form and that kind of thing so it's always good to have everybody have a separate account just so you can kind of see what people are doing on the site you can see you know if, if there was a change made you can say oh who made that change and you can kind of go back to them and, and you know if you have any questions about it you know who did it and what time and that kind of thing so it's better to have everyone have their own user account instead of to share a user account just so that you can keep track of, of who's done what on the site. And then also, if someone from your organization leaves, so if we go back to users, and let's 
find my find my user. I have a lot of test users. So here's the one I just made. If that person leaves, then you can just take their permissions away. You can make them a user or you can make them inactive. And you take their permissions away and then you just have to sort of take permissions away from one person and you don't have to go update all your, you know, update all your passwords and all of that good stuff. So um, if you're adding, that's how you add a user on the on the site. And you can also, if you don't want to give them super user permissions, and edit my same person again. I'm going to make them active. Um, I can make this person just a regular user and then I can give them, so just because they're a user, all that means is they can log in. It doesn't necessarily mean they can do too much. So I can make this person a user and then I can, I can give this specific person permission. So under options here, you'll see permissions. So without making them a full-fledged super user, I can give them permission. So for instance, with the, let's do the job board. With the job board, I can sit, these are all the permissions that are sort of related to the jobs. Add, change, delete, view. If I highlight all of these and click add, and so they move from available permissions to chosen permissions, then I've just given this user pretty much all, all of they I've given them permissions to do anything they need to within just the job board without having to make them a super user. So for instance, if you have somebody within your organization who you want to manage the job board or manage the events calendar, but that's all that you want them to do, you can create a user account for them, you can edit their permissions, and you can give them, you know, whatever specific permissions you want them to have. You can do that on a kind of one-on-one -on -one basis, and you don't have to give them super user permissions. So if you, you know, if you have an intern or if you have somebody in another department that you want to give kind of partial permissions but not super user, that's how you do that. And then if you want to look, you know, search through your list of users and see who's there, you just go to people users and you can see everybody, see everyone who has an account on your site. So that is the end of our intro to tendency curriculum. It's about an hour and a half. I know it's a lot to get through. I know it's, um, it's, it's, a lot to cover, but that is our, um, that is our, our, my, my over, that's my, we've gotten through our agenda. One thing that I just want to say is we do post a lot of updates on the Tendency blog, which is blog.tendency.com. If you make sure you're following that blog and you can kind of see, well, when we roll out new features, when we have updates, we'll post things on the Tendency blog. Um, when we have new, you know, help files or things like that, we'll post it on the Tendency blog. Also, if you go to tendency.com slash newsletter, if you would like to sign up for our newsletter, we send out a newsletter about once a week, um, sometimes every other week, whenever we have, we'll post things like, again, new updates or upcoming training or new help files or things like that. This is a good way to have those updates kind of pushed to your inbox. So tendency.com slash newsletter, just fill out your name and email and you'll get added to that list and you'll get those emails when we have um, new content available. So that is intro, intro to tendency.